Good morning. We begin this morning with general questions, and our first question is from Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the proposals in the draft budget could support town centres in the Glasgow, Maryhill and Springburn constituency. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Well, I announced a, a wide package of measures in the budget to support town centres, including maintaining a competitive business rates package, which caps the increase in the rate poundage below inflation, ensures that 90% of properties in Scotland pay a lower poundage than other parts of the UK, supports small businesses through a small business bonus scheme, which lifts small businesses out of rates altogether, and a new town centre fund of £50 million to drive local economic activity and support town centres to become more diverse and thrive in places. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Town centres, presiding officer in my constituency, suffer from the pool of Glasgow City Centre, as well as poor immunity and significant deprivation factors. That is why I was pleased to see the return of the Town Centre Regeneration Fund in the Scottish Government's draft budget. That is a fund which previously secured £1.8 million for the renovation of the stunning Maryhill Borough Halls in my constituency and drove regeneration in that area. Does the Minister agree with me that it is important for applicants to the new Town Centre Fund to demonstrate strategic a, a strategic but community-led approach to regeneration initiatives, something which I am pleased to say we are developing strongly in the two of the town centres in my constituency, namely at Postle Park and at Springburn. Cabinet Secretary. I just want to make two points. First of all, I agree that Mary Hill Borough Halls is a great example of how town centre investment can have huge positive impact. I'm very uh, familiar uh, with the project and I absolutely uh, agree with that kind of community involvement and community support. But in relation to the town centre fund, I want to deliver this in partnership with local authorities. I'll engage with COSLA as to how we uh, distribute and allocate that investment. We do want it to be transformational, but I want to deliver this fund uh, in partnership with local government, and of course, that means local communities. Question number two, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to statistics stating that eligible pensioners in Motherwell and Airdrie received double the number of cold weather payments as those in Bells Hill and Coat Bridge in 2017-18. Cabinet Secretary, Shirley Ann Somerville. The Department for Work and Pensions were responsible for the administration of the cold weather payment scheme in 2017-18. In developing the new cold spell heating assistance benefit, we are engaging with households who have claimed the existing benefit and a wide range of expert opinion. We will seek the views of experienced panel members who have applied for and benefited from cold weather payments as part of our research plan for 2019-20 and will consider, uh, continue to listen to the views and consider ways to better meet the needs of vulnerable households across Scotland. Mark Griffin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Ne next week, it's very likely that the trigger point for payments will be met at the Salisbury weather station, but that is less assured for the Bishopton station. And as a result, um, constituents in Airdrie, um, pensioners on pension credit, will likely receive a payment, but those in an adjacent street that fall into the Coatbridge po postcode can be less assured of that money. And can the Cabinet Secretary give a commitment today that by next winter, cold spell heating assistance will be fully delivered by Social Security Scotland, and as a result, people in Coatbridge, Bellswear, Bells Hill and other um, areas around the country will stop being worse off than their close neighbours in Motherwell and Airdrie? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I do recognise that there have been concerns expressed by many members um, in the past regarding the number of weather stations that cover Scotland that are used to determine the trigger for cold weather payments. There are currently um, 18. Um, that is something which many members have both asked questions on and I've had correspondence um, with. All those issues will be taken account of, as I had said in my original answer, with the work ongoing with experienced panels, um, and I will update Parliament in due course on the wave two benefits, including those to do with cold weather payments. Thank you. Question number three, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government when it will fulfil the commitment made by the then Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure in January 2016 to double track key pinch points on the East Coast railway line between Aberdeen and the Central Belt. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mathis. Uh, the report commissioned by Aberdeen to Central Belt Reference Group considered the duelling of the section at Montrose did not provide journey time improvements 
and may not represent value for money. Uh, whilst we acknowledge that some parties feel there has been a lack of progress on this project, there is no question that everyone wants, to, wants an appropriate and affordable solution to the capacity constraints. The consensus the reference group had was that further work is required to identify the maximum possible benefits achievable, achievable for the £200 million that's being invested, uh, and the group are committed to taking forward this work as quickly as possible. Lewis MacDonald. The Cabinet Secretary will recall that the commitment made three years ago was that this was an initial £200 million, that it would include double tracking of key pinch points and that it was intended to secure economic benefits for the North East. Given that the option study presented by Transport Scotland to the City Region Deal Committee uh, before Christmas uh, failed on all of those uh, requirements, what will he do to ensure that an approved investment plan is put in place so that that £200 million is indeed spent on ensuring we have the right modern rail infrastructure, specifically between Aberdeen and Dundee, uh, to which his government made that commitment three years ago? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, officer, I recognise the important value of making sure we get the right investments into the transport infrastructure into the northeast of Scotland, particularly in rail <laughs> infrastructure. Um, and the uh, £200 million pounds of investment we intend to make into this line continues to be there uh, in order to do that. Uh, what's critical to this is making sure that that investment uh, maximises the improvements we are seeking to try and achieve uh, on that particular line, uh, particularly in relation to journey times uh, and speeding up uh, journey times. And that's why the Arup report has set out a range of different issues that need to be considered in order to make sure we maximise the benefits that will come from this investment, which I would expect to be taken in line with the, uh, the Aberdeen City deal, which takes it up to 2026. So I can assure the member that the reference group are committed in working together to make sure that this investment is utilised in a way that maximises the benefit for commuters who are using that particular line going forward. And Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Recent timetable changes mean that Montrose is now a major interchange station, but the facilities for passengers are totally inadequate, particularly if you're travelling alone at night. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell me, when did you last raise the issue of an upgrade to Montrose Station with Transport Scotland, and when do you expect an upgrade to take place? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so we look at uh, investing in our rail infrastructure right across Scotland on an ongoing basis and in the uh, next rail uh, control period we will be investing almost £5 billion in infrastructure right across uh, Scotland. Uh, that will look at prioritising different rail stations where there is a need for investment to be made and that could also include uh, the station at Montrose. The member will be aware of the very significant investment we're making into the northeast of Scotland at the present time. On the Aberdeen to Inverness line, we're investing some £330 million into that line. It's provided a new station, upgrading in existing facilities, and we'll continue to make sure we invest in the rail services right across the northeast of Scotland and across the rest of the country. Question number four, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to NHS Forth Valleys being escalated to stage three on the NHS Board Performance Escalation Framework. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. <clears throat> Following a sustained period of low performance against the national four-hour A&E target, the board was escalated to stage three on the escalation framework in December last year. Stage three indicates there is significant variation from where performance should be and that tailored support is required. We're now formally supporting NHS Forth Valley in a structured way, including supporting the development of formal recovery plans and clear milestones, working with the local team, including the chief executive and senior management team at Forth Valley, to return the board to a sustainable position of performance against a four-hour target. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and I would pay tribute to the hard-working clinicians, doctors, nurses, auxiliary and clinical staff who on a day-to-day -day basis do all they can to support patients in Forth Valley. But having these classifications is a damning indictment on health chiefs. And what is the Cabinet Secretary doing as a matter of urgency to rectify this situation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I thank Mr Stewart for that follow-up uh, uh, question. I too would pay tribute to the hard-working staff in Forth Valley and indeed across our health service. I don't accept that escalation to stage three uh, is a damning indictment. Uh, of anyone, to be honest, and I don't think that that language particularly helps uh, those hard-working staff to whom he and I have just paid uh, tribute. What it does indicate is 
uh, that there is a need for structured and formal intervention and support from uh, the Scottish Government to a board. I think that is entirely the right thing to do and I'm sure what members would expect me to do and what citizens across Scotland would expect me to do in order to address situations where we have uh, persistent underperformance in particular areas in the area of Forth Valley. That's our A&E target, a vital target that we need to meet and uh, one where I'm sure with that support, Forth Valley will return to the sustainable position we need them to have. Question five has not been lodged. Question number six, Neil Bibby. Um, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the future of the Construction Industry Training Board and the National Construction College campus in Scotland. Minister Richard Lockhead. The Construction Industry Training Board recently announced as a result of a review, a review of operations across the UK that part of the role will be transferred to Shared Services Connected Limited. And as part of the announcement, the Construction Industry Training Board has placed in the market the National Construction College at Inchinnan, but has confirmed they do not intend to close the training facility. Responsibilities, of course, for these changes lie with the UK Government, but the Scottish Government will provide support to employees who potentially face redundancy. Neil Bibby. Uh, I thank the Minister for that response. This is a very concerning time for CITB staff in Renfrewshire, where the campus is based. I welcome Jamie Hepburn's meeting yesterday with the GMB Trade Union. Although oversight of CITB is reserved, training policy is devolved. Can I ask the Minister, will the Scottish the Government therefore assess the impact these changes could have on training standards in the Scottish construction sector? Will he make representations to CITB and SSCL to help keep these jobs in Renfrewshire, including the 29 administration staff who face the prospect of being paid off in October? And is he also prepared to explore other avenues to retain these jobs and the knowledge of these workers in Scotland? Minister. We are, of course, concerned about the impact that this uh, change will have on employees who may not transfer as part of the process and who may indeed face uh, redundancy. Uh, as the member mentioned, Jamie Hepburn, my colleague, met the GMB uh, yesterday to discuss a number of issues that arise out of these changes. Uh, we are convinced that our system for training within the construction sector remains robust. However, we will, of course, learn any lessons that have to be learned uh, and check uh, if there's any detrimental impact, which we're keen to avoid, of the changes with the CITB. Uh, and indeed, we are monitoring many of the issues the member mentions very, very closely, and we'll keep him informed. Question number seven, Margaret Mitchell. The presiding officer to ask the Scottish Government what action it plans to address parking issues around the Scottish Crime Campus in Gartgosh. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Crime Campus Management Board represents the partners located at the campus. It continues to work with campus staff and other stakeholders to identify and implement a solution to the present parking issue. Scottish Government officials attend meetings of the Management Board and through that forum are engaging with interested parties to hopefully explore uh, possible future options. Is the Minister aware that the issue of inadequate parking at the campus is dating back to 2014 and has resulted in cars being parked in verges, damaging the draining system and causing flooding? Can the Minister confirm the action taken to address this flooding? And more generally, can the Scottish Government, perhaps, if the Minister can't confirm this, if all these issues will be included in the review of the suitability of Gartgosh as a possible site for the new Monklands Hospital? Well, I'll, I'll absolutely ensure that the issues uh, raised by Margaret Mitchell are part uh, of that uh, consideration. I don't doubt that they will be, but I'll, I'll, I'll reaffirm and confirm that. I am aware, of course, to my many visits to Gartkosh, uh, you can see the cars parked uh, on the verge. is clearly uh, an issue there. Uh, there is a potential, depending on, uh, of course, what happens with the site adjacent to Gartkosh, a possibility to look at uh, short, uh, medium and indeed long-term options for that parking. Uh, issue. I'd be happy to take that away with Margaret Mitchell to discuss perhaps in a little bit more detail. Some of that will depend, uh, of course, on NHS Lanarkshire's uh, decision, uh, of course, on where the new Monklands Hospital uh, may well be. And Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. But I think it's legitimate to ask the Minister if he will recognise that given these existing problems, which I have also been dealing with on behalf of constituents for a number of years, that, a major, uh, that major building works associated with a new hospital would worsen this situation for Crime Campus staff and local residents. Would the Minister recognise that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as mentioned, there is a review uh, underway, of course, and that is expected to report. Uh, late uh, in February uh, of this year. So uh, I'm sure all of that has been taken into consideration. I don't doubt that uh, for a minute, but clearly uh, she has put that on the record and I know the Health Secretary has also uh, heard what she has to say. 
Question number eight, Ian Gray. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to a recent EIS survey which found that 75% of teachers experience stress due to their workload. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, we take the well-being of all of Scotland's teachers very seriously and we continue to seek to address undue workload wherever we can to free teachers to, treat, to teach. We have sought to tackle bureaucracy and reduce workload through a range of measures. These include the Chief Inspector of Education's definitive guidance on curriculum for excellence, the publication of benchmarks in each curriculum area, the rationalisation of a significant volume of educational guidance and the launch of an online tackling bureaucracy toolkit. We've also taken steps to increase the number of teachers in our schools. Ian Gray. The trouble is that teachers know these measures have been taken, uh, but they don't feel that they have addressed the pressures they face. Indeed, Larry Flanagan, the General Secretary of the EIS, commented on the survey by saying, the survey results confirm the deep-set impact of workload pressures on teachers and lecturers, largely arising out of changes to the curriculum, and paint a worrying picture of a profession under the cosh. The survey also highlighted that half of teachers would be reluctant to recommend teaching as a career. Does the Cabinet Secretary understand that teachers' anger, their willingness to contemplate strike action, is not just about pay, it is about workload too. And what new and concrete proposals does he have to reduce teacher workload and stress? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well, let me address a number of the points that Ian Gray has raised there. Um, he quotes Larry Flanagan in relation to changes to the curriculum. And what the government has been intent on doing over a number of years is to be involved in the professional associations in much of the curriculum development work that we undertake. That's why the EIS are members, for example, of the Scottish Education Council, so they can influence our thinking on many of these questions. Uh, as I indicated in my response earlier to Mr Gray, we've taken a number of steps to reduce the workload of teachers. I remain absolutely engaged on this question, and what I think is uh, essential is that we see the sustained activity at school, local authority, and at national level to take particular initiatives to reduce the level of administrative bureaucracy within individual schools. The purpose of that will enable teachers to be free to teach, and that's exactly what we want them to do. Question number nine, Maurice Corrie. To ask the Scottish Government what compensation it can offer to commuters who use Helensborough Central Railway Station in light of reports of frequent delays and cancellations. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scots Rail franchise ensures that passengers can be compensated for, compensated for disruption to their journeys by delay repay compensation scheme, uh, which is calculated by the amount of delay uh, to the passenger journey over 30 minutes. Uh, I've made very clear in the Chamber before that performance across the country, uh, not least the Helmsborough, is below the challenging but achievable punctuality standards we expect and demand from the rail industry. Uh, ScotRail have recently announced a compensation promotion, although this is limited to the routes worst affected by cancellations due to staff shortages affected, affecting passengers during December. Uh, performance on the Helensburgh line has seen a steady improvement over the past couple of weeks and uh, was, uh, in recent times has now moved from a period during period 10 where the PPM was at 80.7%, and so far in this period, which commenced on the 6th of January, PPM to date is now at 89.2%. Maurice Corrie. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. <clears throat> Yet amongst many examples I've met with a constituent in my area who missed a job interview and subsequently was not offered another interview due to cancelled and delayed trains. Under the standard scheme, he was only offered £1 in compensation. Can I seek the assurance from the, Minister, from the Cabinet Secretary that these commuters will receive in future fair compensation? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, I very much regret the uh, inconvenience that his constituent uh, was put at uh, from the delay in that particular service. As it's set out within the franchise agreement, there is a, uh, a delay, delay repayment scheme which is set out for ScotRail to implement, which is what they are implementing. Uh, but in a very specific case, the member raised, I'll ask that ScotRail uh, contact him in order to explore that matter further. Question number 10, Donald Cameron. Ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support the development of Scotland's ports. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mathis. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting Scotland's ports and harbours, whilst recognising that ports in Scotland operate in a commercial environment and are substantially self-funding. 
in certain circumstances and in compliance with restrictions on state aid, the Scottish Government can provide grant funding to improve uh, to approve schemes. Uh, ports will also uh, be a focus for the Scottish Ministers as we take forward the Scottish Maritime Strategy, which has been developed this year. Donald Cameron. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware that the Stornoway Port Authority is seeking to invest in a new deep water port uh, in order to allow Stornoway to capitalise on the leisure cruise industry. What support can the Government offer ports such as Stornoway that are looking to expand and attract new business? Cabinet Secretary. I'm, officer, I'm uh, conscious that a number of ports across uh, Scotland are engaged in providing greater access to those who are on uh, leisure cruises and it's important we try to maximise the benefits that can come uh, from these matters. Uh, we're engaged with a number of different parties in these particular ports in order to look at what further assistance can be provided and in relation to the one in Stornoway uh, we'll give consideration to that in working in partnership with the local authority and the harbour agency.